Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. to praise God in his kingdom. Moved by the spirit, one who lives in love lives in God. And God lives in him. What a wonderful thing is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, welcome. And we just have wonderful, wonderful family here tonight from everywhere. And I know you're wondering, where did these two come from? Well, since I went to uh, Colombia in South America, I never really had a devotion to anybody. You know, I liked all the saints. I suppose my one devotion was Jesus and Mary. Um, but I never had a saint devotion or devotion to any part of our Lord's life. And um, so when we went to Colombia to, in South America and all of South America, we took us uh, about three, four weeks to do that. We went to every country, this is about three years ago, and we, told, we talked to nuncios and bishops and cardinals and told them that EWTN was coming into South America. And we hoped they would help us, and we had hoped that they would begin to make programs in their own dialects, in their own language. Uh, we didn't come in to Americanize uh, South America. And so we were invited to Colombia. And the priest that hosted us there uh, gave us uh, a wonderful tour. And he said, would you like to see the church dedicated to the child Jesus? And I said, oh, yeah. Well, I walked in, and uh, in this church was huge. And thank you. This is a mustache cup that I don't have a mustache. You see that? <laughs> It's to keep the ice away from my nose. Anyway, when I walked in, and in the middle of this huge church was a, a huge courtyard. In fact, about 2,000 people stood there, and, and we had mass standing in that courtyard. Well, I got inside in this courtyard, and in the corner, I saw a bust of a priest. And I thought, I wonder who he is. And I walked over there, and to my shock and surprise, it said Father John Rizzo, and I couldn't believe it, because my father's name was John Rizzo, and I, I thought, my golly, there's one good John Rizzo in this world. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe there was one good one, you know. But he was good. And I don't know if you heard uh, the bishop from uh, Peru this morning, but he was talking about the simplicity of becoming holy. It's not a big deal, you know. All you need to do is the will of God. That shouldn't be hard. We know God knows better than we do. But anyway, this was a very, very simple priest. And so I said, Father, tell me about him. 
He said, well, he came from Italy. And I thought, oh, well, I must be right, you know. <laughs> and I thought he was going to say he's color braised because my father was color braised. And I didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> and um, he said he came over. There were no churches and just little, little places. And mostly were outside. And so he had great devotion to the child Jesus. This particular one. And, and he didn't know what to do. So he put two tables out. And he had the child Jesus on one. And he said mass on the other. And in the middle of his sermon, he would talk to the child Jesus. He's a simple man. And one day he said, Divino Nino. You see these people? They're hungry. They have no one to feed them. Now, if you don't feed them, they're going to kill me and smash you. <laughs> I mean, that was putting it bluntly, don't you think? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came carts of food. Every kind of vegetable and well, they were amazed. They went crazy. And so the next week, even more came. And more food came. So now, after all of that, the people start bringing in the sick. And people on stretchers and kind of make up uh, wheelchairs. And, and oh, he got scared, you know. He's looking at all these people, and they're looking at him like, do something. But he's desperate. So he looks at the child Jesus again and he says, Divino Nino, you see all these people there, they're sick. They have no money for doctors. Uh, you have to heal them. If you don't, they're going to kill me and smash you. <laughs> I guess he felt if it worked once, it ought to work again, <laughs> you know? And one man way out in the corner hadn't walked for years and years. He jumped up. He stopped walking. Everybody was screaming, and the deaf heard, and the blind could see. They went crazy. And every Sunday, more would come. So he went to his superior, and he said, I would like to build a church. And he said, with what? <laughs> he said, the people will build it. They don't have money, but they have talent. So, well, as long as it doesn't cost anything. And so he talked to all the people, and they came forth, and they got rocks and bricks and built a very beautiful church. Well, I went to see, the father said to me, do you want to go up and, and see the original statue? I thought, oh, yeah. You know, I could had a few words to say to him myself. <laughs> And I remember I worried about the network. Debts were, you know, increasing. And, and so I, I thought, well, I'll talk to him about that. So we went up the steps in back of the big basilica. And there he was way up about 15 feet. And just about that big. And, and covered, so, you know. So I was just standing there looking at him, and all of a sudden, uh, he became real. And he turned towards me. My heart was beating 100 miles an hour, because I didn't expect it. And he looked at me with the most awesome eyes you ever want to see. And he said to me, this little fellow here, uh, build me a temple, and I will help those who help you. Well, I started to cry, and my sisters came out. There were two of them, and they said, what's the matter? I thought, oh, nothing, nothing. But I knew I had to do something. And we were hard up at the network, let alone build a temple. And I didn't know what the word temple meant, because I never heard a Catholic church called temple. So when we went to Italy a couple of months later, I saw in the big basilica of St. Peter's, it said, this temple 
<laughs> I thought, wow, I hope you're not asking for something this big. <laughs> Oh, wait. <laughs> anyway, um, I forgot where I was. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I knew what he meant. So I came home, I told the sisters. And they said, well, what do we do now? I said, well, you look for land. If you want the temple, you got to have land. We worked about four or five months, I guess. We looked everywhere. Just about ready to give up. I didn't know where else to look. And this real estate agent said to me, I have one more place. And we went there and I got out of the car, crutches and all. And I knew that was the place. I knew it was the place because it had a presence of God about it. Yeah, I never felt anywhere. And one of the sisters was with me and she was going down to the river. The river surrounds it, it's like a peninsula. And she found on the ground a rock and it had a cross on it. I said, well, this is it. And so now I have great devotion, unbelievable devotion to the child Jesus. And that same trip, you don't mind me telling sharing this with you, do you? No. Since you don't know what you came for, and neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> it won't matter, will it? <laughs> well, we went to Peru. I hope I don't get him all wet here. Come on, baby, you won't mind. We come on. There you go. Okay. And we were there. And I was invited to give a talk to a couple hundred people. It turned out to be 17,000 people. <laughs> and I, I, never, I never saw that many people. The marvelous thing is they had walked all night to get there. So I gave them a talk. The three of us were almost crushed to death because they keep pressing in on you, you know, and their enthusiasm to touch your head, anything. And, and uh, it was so tight that one of our sisters had a, a um, toothpaste in her purse and it squashed. <laughs> I mean, it was everywhere. <laughs> and the two sisters were frightened, you know, because with crutches, you don't know who you're gonna trip or who's gonna trip you. And they kept saying, oh my God, we're gonna die. And they start renewing their vows, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh my God, I'm hardly sorry for that. I said, well, you two shut up. <laughs> <laughs> We're not dying. <laughs> anyway, the most beautiful thing, I got up and I gave a talk and they translated for me. And the people who were so poor wanted to give me something. And they didn't look like this, Sister Gabriel made this little suit for him. And this is the child Jesus they gave me, and the chair. And if you see him, isn't he cute? The sad thing about this statue is, I take off your little boot, okay? I better not lose it. He's looking at his foot, and it's got a nail in it. And, and he's looking at it, knowing what's going to happen, and probably stepped on it, and it's got a little bit of blood here, and it gone down his leg here, see? Can y'all see that? Hmm? Can y'all see that? And his hair was kind of matted, but sister fixed him up. Well, you're not looking too hot now, baby. <laughs> uh, you're not. But I love you. And he's got, he's got a, a very kind of pitiful uh, look on his face because he knows what's coming. It's the only statue I ever saw like this. You know, most statues look real pretty and nice. But this one, well, he's different. I got to put your little booty on. I don't know if I'm going to do it right, but we'll try. Okay, there we go. Now I'll push it aside and you can look at it. 
of that, huh? No. Just pray I don't drop it. He would not be happy over that. <coughs> there we go. You okay? There we are. So that's what happened. <coughs> <coughs> and that's where I got my devotion to the child Jesus. And I just, before you go to bed tonight, say something to him. You know, we're always after the adult Jesus. Well, I am too. This ring says Jesus in between. But I think there are parts of our Lord's life that, uh, that somebody somewhere in the world has worship and love and devotion to some part of our Lord's life you never thought of. Like his teaching life. His life in, the, in Bethlehem. His life of going around with the apostles who never understood what he was talking about. All you teachers ought to feel good about that, you know. Some of your students never catch on. You just pass them on to the next grade and they don't catch on. And by the time they graduate, they can't even read. But Jesus had that same problem. And you might have devotion to that part of his life. You might have devotion to the time he was alone up on the mountain <clears throat> praying. He had to get up very early and quietly because the apostles were always there. And he wanted so much to be alone with his father. And so people all over the world have very special devotions. And I'm going to promote, to the best of my ability, the devotion to this one. Because I think this one is what we need today. Once we have love for him at six, seven years old. And once we know that he knew what was coming, then maybe, maybe our whole attitude will change. And we'll begin to appreciate what God has done for us by coming as a child, as a baby, in a crib. So I promised you tonight that we would continue our seven gifts. And I'm not going to forget that. I would put this down here, but he's taken up the whole room here. And I'm sure he doesn't mind. It's the first time he's been on. That's cute, don't you think? I think he is. Considering I've never had a devotion to anybody. I love the Lord. He chose me to be spouse. And I'm grateful for that. I've enjoyed my vocation, and I hope I will till the Lord calls. But this little one here, he's the one we got to know, all of us. Because we're not afraid of a child. Those of you that are so many, have so many committed so many sins, you can't even count them, go to him. You can't be afraid of him. He's a little one. And he's the child that will lead us. And then when you think he was in the Eucharist, he is in the Eucharist. Body, blood, soul, divinity. You know, it's one thing to be a child when you can run and people see you run and you can hug somebody. And, but in the Eucharist, he hides his glory, his majesty with such beauty. So we and he can become one. Well, that kind of humility we had not explain. We, we just can't, you know. We just have to accept it because we cannot explain the awesome mercy of God. So having said all that and having excited your curiosity for next Tuesday night, I hope that next Tuesday will be our largest audience. I must tell you, the power of a child. That's why I want this little kid up there. See, he's not much taller than the baby Jesus, child Jesus. Such a humiliating thing if all the great leaders of society that made such a mess of the world would be led by one like him. <laughs> Ooh, 
Wouldn't that just knock them down, huh? <laughs> We're all gone nuts trying to figure out how we could change the world. It's just like God to say, well, let me show you a few things. And a little child shall lead them. Well, I got you in, buddy. You got to do some work now. <laughs> so now we're talking about the spirit of understanding. I promised you that, and I didn't want to go back on my promise. There are seven gifts, as you know, and that's always and also in 11, uh, a chapter of Isaiah's. And the first, of course, is the fear of the Lord. I have to be, I have to love God in such a way I don't want to hurt him. That's what fear of the Lord is. Then there's piety. I have to know God as my father. And then there is that great gift of fortitude. I got to have courage. God, no matter what happens to me, I must see the will of God. Then comes counsel. Oh, we need counsel, huh? How do you discern the difference between the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, and the evil spirit? That is tough. Because the world tells you one thing, and God says the opposite. And if you don't read the Bible and you don't listen to the church, you're in trouble. Why? Because you don't know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, how are you going to choose? <laughs> but it's a shame to face truth the first time in your life at death. We've got to face truth our whole life. And if we don't, then what are we going to do, huh? Some of you listening to me tonight haven't been to confession in years. Years. You say, well, I'm healthy. I got, a ch I got time. <laughs> You're a loony toony. <laughs> People die in their sleep. In accidents. You can't say that. You know not the time or the day or the hour. You can't say you got time. That's a stupid answer. So you got to go to confession. Some of you are in hospitals and you're listening to me tonight hoping to get courage and I hope I gave you some. But you had to face the truth. You're on your way out, sweetheart. <laughs> the doctor already told you. There's no more I can do for you. How much time? Well, a couple of weeks. Ooh, that ought to make your blood curdle. <laughs> or do something. And you're sitting there or laying there telling me you got time? <laughs> you got to get right with God. That's the truth. That's all. I shouldn't scare you. Truth should never scare you. This guy down here should scare you. Mm. So, yeah, I had the gift of knowledge a couple of weeks ago. Now we have the gift of understanding. The Lord gave me this book in 1970 something or other. Well, they didn't put it down, but it was in the 70s. If you want one, I'll send you one. It is not a free. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was going to say it's free. <laughs> I don't even know what it's worth. Got a lot of stuff in it. But I don't know, $2, something like that. Now, what does a gift of understanding do? Did you ever read the scriptures? And then you put it down, you forgot about it, and you had a hard day, maybe a desperate day, a tragic day. And you're desperate and you just don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, a passage of scripture comes to your mind. Like, fear not. I will be with you always. And then, somehow, you don't know how, but somehow, 
The tragedy is still there, the heartache is still there, but it feels lighter. That is the gift of understanding. Not only did you read scripture maybe months ago, but suddenly it became alive. Suddenly grace to change came with it. That's a special gift from the Holy Spirit. You didn't do a thing. You're over there moping, crying, whatever. And all of a sudden this comes to you and your heart is liar and you, you're able to, to have the strength to, to bear whatever it is. That's the gift of understanding. It gives you light to penetrate the mystery. We all believe in the Trinity. We all believe in the Immaculate Conception. We, we believe all these things, or we should. If we're Catholic, you should. We, we can't explain them. The greatest of theologians try to explain them, but we still don't quite understand how God was always. My mother had a problem with that. Oh, golly, she'd say to me, where did God come from? I said, he never came from anything or anyone. He always was. How could he always was? I said, well, he always was and always will be. I know that, but where did he come from? <laughs> Nobody knows. Then how do you know? I said, I didn't say I knew. I'm just saying that God was always, he's never a moment that there was not God. Yeah. I said, yeah. But where did he come from? I said, <laughs> I, why don't we change the subject, Mom? You know, there are other things we can think about. <laughs> but see, that's a mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because there was a time I was not. There was a time you were not. A hundred years ago, I was not. Except in the mind of God. And neither were you. A hundred years from now, this entire studio will be wiped out. Boom. And there'll be other people's, maybe a hundred years, we won't even have a studio, who knows. But see, that's the, the circle of life. Because we have another home. Because God thought of me and you before time began. <laughs> I can't imagine that, you know, it's hard for me. Before there was a, a, bleed, a blade of grass, before there was an atom, God knew me and He knew you. And He decided on April 20th, 1923, I would be on uh, your midst. My grandma said when I was born, I looked like I was five months old. <laughs> Fat. red cheek and lots of hair. <laughs> now that part of me, except for the fat, is gone. <laughs> <coughs> My sisters call it motherliness. <laughs> that's a nice term, but that's all it is, a term. But he knew that, you see, and he knew that in this day, in 1999, I would be speaking to you, and you would be here listening. Mm. That kind of God loves me, and he loves you. Mm. And, and he became this little, you know, just a little guy, small, with all that intelligence. It's awesome. You, you, we don't understand all those things. We have to accept them because, you know, my grandmother never believed anyone could ever go to the moon. In fact, she didn't believe in television. 
I entered in 1944, that many moons away. And, and I said to her one day, Grandma, do you know, they got something called television. She said, what's that? And I said, well, you, you go in any bar, they have uh, price fights. <laughs> My grandma looked at me and said, how do you know? <laughs> I said, well, I didn't go in any bar. That's, I'm just telling you what I read. And, and she said, where do they, do they have price fight in the bar? I said, no, grandma, they have it on a screen. Well, where are they? I said, well, they're miles away. Oh, that's poppycock. I don't believe that. Well, if I would have told her, Grandma, a man landed on the moon. It was Nevada somewhere. <laughs> well, she wouldn't know because she would not comprehend the technology we have today that could put a man on the moon and we can see him walk very slowly and See, they, we don't understand. Our minds are too small. That's what happened to St. Augustine, you know, the great doctor of the church. He, the great sinner, too. All you ought to get courage from St. Augustine. He did things you never thought of doing. <laughs> I think. <laughs> but anyway, He's walking down the ocean, the, uh, the uh, sand there, and he saw this little boy. And, and he was, had a little hole in the sand. He had a little seashell. And he'd run to the ocean. He'd come with that water. he put it in this hole. Then he'd run back to the ocean and get some more water. And he put it in that hole. And Augustine looked at him a long time. He went up to him and said, son, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm trying to put that ocean in this hole. <laughs> oh, he laughed and he said, you can't do that. And the child looked at him and said, neither can you understand the Trinity. It was a hole, a small hole. And we're always trying to put the ocean in a hole and our faith is shattered. Because we can't grasp, we don't believe. Huh? And that's what the gift of understanding does for you. It pen makes you penetrate the mysteries even though your mind is small and puny. And, and you say, well, I have an IQ of 280. <sighs> what does that prove? <laughs> that you have an IQ of 280, that's all. I've always felt sorry for geniuses, probably because I wasn't one. <laughs> but they never seem to have any fun. You know, they're so smart sometimes that they just have to know everything and they get bored. But see, we can never be bored with God because this gift of understanding allows me through faith to grasp what I do not comprehend with a surety. Nobody will ever tell me, they may tell me, but that Jesus is not in the Eucharist, that he's a symbol, that he's this, that. No, 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 no. He's there. If you walk into any church to the blood sacrament exposed, or even in the tabernacle, you could say, hello, Jesus. I just came for a visit. And he would say, welcome. I've been waiting for you. Ooh, wouldn't that be awesome? Mm -hmm. But what does that? What makes you so sure? <laughs> the gift of understanding. You're sure. If somebody were to say to me now, where is Jesus? I'd say right here. Why? Because he said where there are two gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. Well, Lord, we got more than two here. <laughs> so he's here. And I think he's pleased. I hope he likes his portrayal of him. 
This is the one from Colombia. This is the one from Peru. But it all attracts different people and different things. But that's the light also of the gift of understanding. I feel sorry for St. Anthony. You never think of him unless you lose something. <laughs> Did you know he was a great theologian? And he performed 13 miracles a day? A day. But what do we think of? Oh, I lost my purse. St. Anthony, please help me. I lost my purse. Do we know how awesome he preached? And one time he went to a village and nobody would pay attention to him. This crazy man is here again. You know what he did? He didn't get angry like I would. He went to the seashore and he said, Brother Fish, come. I wish to speak to thee about your creator. And all of a sudden, the ocean began to move. And little fish came in the front and the sizes got bigger, bigger, bigger and the whales way in the back. And they were in a straight line listening to St. Anthony. And he spoke to them, and all of a sudden, those villagers were scared stiff. <laughs> Good for them. They came very slowly, and they were amazed. And they were all quiet, and suddenly St. Anthony said, Well, now, you have heard the word of your Creator. Go now. And they all nodded. <laughs> Can you imagine all these big fish and little fish and tiny fish nodding and they disappear? Wow. How you like that? Well, see that he's, he's more than a finder of something. I feel sorry for St. Joseph because he always has a lily in his hand. <laughs> He was not a florist. <laughs> I know it's symbolic of his purity, but he's always looked so old. What are we trying to prove? I think St. Joseph was a very young man. We're trying to prove, oh, Mary was safe with him. I've seen some old men I wouldn't want to be a friend. <laughs> no, he was a very young man who had made his commitment to God. He was worthy of being spouse of the most holy woman. And worthy, as far as our human nature goes, chosen by God before time began, to be the foster father of Jesus. One of my sisters said this morning that sometimes you see St. Joseph, our, our sweet mother is on the, the donkey and St. Joseph is by her side. It looks like they ought to switch places, you know, because <laughs> he's so old. St. <laughs> Joseph was a vibrant, wonderful young man to who had the strength and the courage to defend and provide for the two holiest persons in the whole wide world. I feel sorry for our Holy Father Francis, too. When you see a statue of St. Francis, what do you see? A dog, a wolf, a pigeon. He was not a vet. <laughs> you see, we, he was a holy man, so holy that our dear Lord imprinted his own wounds on his hands, his feet, 
his side. He was a simple man, but so holy that, that people were healed just looking at him. See that? Let, let's not... <clears throat> Let's not make our saints look silly. Let's make our saints what they really were. Men and women of God. With zeal, with all these seven gifts. With great holiness and great union with God. They were men and women like you. Who had struggles and disappointments. And many heartaches. But they never lost sight of God. Never. And they persevered. And they were heroic at times. And you have to be heroic at times. You all have at some point had to be heroic. Today you have to be heroic to be a good Catholic. Because you got so much coming at you. So, I got off course, but that's okay. We have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother. This is Bill from Michigan. Ah, it's a pleasure to talk to you. What's your question, dear? Um, I was raised a Protestant, and through my teenage years and young adult years, have been attracted to the Catholic Church, which has led me to read the Catechism and some books on the Eucharist as well. Yeah. And I was just wondering, what advice, speaking of understanding and the gift of understanding, what advice do you have on how to approach some of the issues that as a Protestant I was not taught, such as communion with the saints, devotion to the Blessed Mother, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the approach to Our Lady is the Bible. The first chapter of Genesis. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, not Eve, not Eve. She already made a big mistake. I will put enmity between thee, the enemy, Satan, and the woman. Uh, the Lord gave me a book called The Promised Woman, and if you like it, write to me and I'll send it to you. And if you notice, our Lord used that word woman a couple times. And the last part of his life, woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. John was not his son. Mary was his mother. But he called her woman. He was trying to tell us something. This is the woman that's in Genesis. The woman that's in the book of Revelations. See, so she's all over the scripture. And on a simple level, you know, as a woman, I, I have such admiration for Our Lady because she never once offended God. Never once. I think that's awesome. Awesome. And the scripture says something that sometimes we don't catch. It says, she stood at the foot of the cross. She didn't face, she didn't yell and scream, she didn't do anything, but stood with Jesus at the foot of the cross. Only the woman could do that. The woman. See? And when our dear Lord said, the one who does the will of my father, is my mother, brother, and sister. The woman. And uh, when our dear Lord was supposedly missing, and he was for three days, at the wedding of Cana, did you ever wonder why at the wedding of Cana? Our, Lord, our Lady says to our Lord, they have no wine. And uh, our Lord says, what is that to thee and me? My time has not yet come. What was he really saying? That was not a rebuke. 
What he was really saying, I cannot perform this miracle unless you, who said yes to my conception, my incarnation, begin my ministry. That's what he was saying to her. Why? Because of the result of what happened. What would you do if you asked your son to do something? And he said, what's that to you and me? You know what you'd have done? You'd have walked away. <laughs> but the woman who never, never said no to God knew exactly what he said. Her fiat, be it done to me according to thy will, the Son of God came down. He was not going to start because that first miracle started everything. What is it you and me, Mother? Why are you asking me, Mother? You must begin. You are the fiat again that must begin my public life. What does she say? <laughs> she says, do. She looks at these servants, says, do whatever he tells you. That's not an answer for a woman that was rebuked. She wasn't rebuked. She began her second fiat. Do whatever he tells you. And there it came. 30 gallon jars of water turned into wine. Oh, you can't imagine such a moment. So great was it that the steward said to the bridegroom, you know, everybody puts the, the good wine out first and then when they're all drunk, he didn't say it that way, but that's what he meant. <laughs> I had my own rendition of scripture. To, he said, then they put out the bad wine. I mean, who knows what you're drinking by that time. He said, but you had put out the good wine last. <laughs> Our lady is that good wine who told us a secret of holiness and the secret of the gift of understanding. Do whatever he tells you. Wow. The woman. You're safe having love for Our Lady. You're safe having devotion to Our Lady because she can only do one thing lead you to Jesus. I hope some of you young teenagers that are, or young men that want to get married, talk to your girlfriend's mother. She'll tell you a lot of things, unless she's jealous. <laughs> if she's jealous, I wouldn't talk to her. Why? Because she's gonna tell you things that are not true. But a girl's mother or a boy's mother knows. And, and just on another simple level, don't you think our lady knows her son? So never be afraid to go to Mary. Can you explain her? Sometimes. Rather pray for those who don't understand. She'll take care. Well, I want to tell you, we're in the slump of summer. Now we can say the slump of summer, or we can say summer slump. In either case, guess what? The donations have gone down considerably for whatever reason. And so I need all of you that have more than you could spend. <laughs> because we're only halfway through the month and we have less than half of what we need. So please, be generous. I love you. God loves you a lot. We'll see you tomorrow night.